My name is Fiona Twycross and I'm a Labour London-wide Assembly member. Speaking from City Hall, two years on from the publication of my report, A Zero Hunger City, which investigated food poverty in London. I chose to investigate the causes of hunger in our city. Having read about child hunger, one of the most shocking things about modern society. The recommendations in my report uh, got all party support from the London Assembly, forcing the Mayor to sign up to making London a zero hunger city by 2020. I wanted to see where we are two years on from the publication of my report. We've seen a really prolific rise in these kind of initiatives which help people with food when they're in some kind of crisis or immediate situation of need for help with food. So particularly food banks, we've seen a huge rise in the last five years in particular, but overall since the year sort of 2000. And what the research is really showing us is the rise in need for this kind of provision. Overall, if we look at the kind of determinants of experiences of food poverty or food insecurity. Stagnating incomes, rising cost of living are really meaning that people are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis to get enough food for themselves and their families. It was set up by Jenny Jones under Ken Livingstone and so it's now coming up for 12 years old. I think it's probably one of the oldest, long, most long-running and established food boards in the world, in any city in fact. There's such a gap now between the kinds of incomes that people have and they don't really realise that if you only have 10 or 15 quid for your week's budget, for your food, for yourself and maybe a kid, that's really, really difficult to do, really difficult. Um, and it is all over the place. Um, people tend to dismiss it, but it's a very real issue. In the year my report was released, there were almost 45,000 visits to Trussell Trust-led food banks in London alone. In the subsequent year, this more than doubled to over 95,000. And behind the statistics, they see the impact food poverty has. The gentleman that came to us, really, really frantic, anxious, couldn't sit down because of his anxiety about the fact that he had no more food in his fridge. He took pictures of his fridge and his cupboard was totally bare. Fridge and cupboards were both bare. He was so anxious, he kept saying, how am I going to feed my kids? How am I going to feed my kids? This is somebody who's contributed all his life. Uh, he's worked, he's a builder, he's had an accident, so he couldn't work for a period. He had applied for benefits, but the process was taking so long, he's now used all the goodwill around him and his savings, and he's got to this space, place where he didn't have anything left. And he's his, his, his anxiety was heightened because he's got children and how was he going to feed his, ch his child that day was his biggest problem. He couldn't sit down and he just kept saying, am I going to feed my kids? Am I going to feed them? I can't. I'm going to pick them up. There's nothing in the house. And that was really, really horror harrowing to, to watch. Behind the statistics are a host of individuals, each with their own story. A woman fleeing domestic violence but without having a bank account of her own. Someone facing a bereavement with the cost of a funeral. Family breakdown. A woman working and paying into the system for in her entire life and being made redundant. Not being able to even start her claim for job seekers allowance until all her savings are gone. People are there at a kind of crisis point but it's often a combination of things that have brought them to that crisis um, and, and they've often exhausted lots of other kind of coping strategies. The first and, and most obvious is what any one of us would do. We, we try and you know, seek help from friends and family. Um, so whether that's um, you know, kind of borrowing money or, or you know, kind of people saying friends would offer to, to cook them meals or they'd go around to their friends and find when they left that there was a tenner slipped in their pocket that they, that, you know, they hadn't recognised. But for some people, obviously, they don't have that safety net that they can access. And for people who've hit a crisis point, maybe you know, they're moved, they've moved away from their friends and their family or support networks. Or actually, for some people, they said, we've just exhausted it. We can't keep asking you know, th th those people. Um, and that's, that's what's led them to, to you know, being at a food bank. In our research, we found that a lot of people, for example, had suffered a bereavement in their family um, or had seen a significant life shock. So a relationship had broken down or they've had to move to a new area. The all-party parliamentary group into hunger and food poverty published the Feeding Britain report in December 2014. It looked at the reasons behind food poverty and concluded that unless we take action, hunger is here to stay. The cross-party, I thought, was important for the basis of it. 
uh, in that the debate about hunger had already become a party political issue. And while it, it was exciting for people to be shouting at one another, not many people got fed as a result. If politicians become involved and get committed, the one thing they could do which would transform the position would be to make sure benefits paid on time, and if it's not paid on time, for people to get emergency payments. That would make a most fundamental difference to the numbers of people who are actually reduced to seeking food bank help. And then secondly, we made a proposal over how people should have a yellow card warning if they're going to be sanctioned. I mean, this year, the number of sanctions has crossed the million mark. Um, and whereas when sanctions on this scale were talked of in the, in the Commons, the MPs were reassured there'd be a whole series of tripwires before anybody lost their benefit. Well, I can't find where these tripwires are. I think probably every MP now has seen in their surgery. Very vulnerable people have no idea why they've lost their benefit. Never been explained in a way that they can comprehend. Changes to benefits mean both those in and out of work are having their budget squeezed. Low paid work is an issue I have raised consistently with the Mayor of London. The interesting thing about the types of people who rely on emergency food aid is that two years ago when I first started writing about this it would often be people who were on benefits, uh, who were unemployed, who had problems with, with debt. Scroll forward 18 months, two years, and you find increasingly that it's pe people in low-paid work. Uh, and that could because they're, be because they're in part-time work or that they're on zero-hours contracts who can't afford to put food on the table and who go to food banks. Now, that's a big change in the kind of people uh, who use food aid. In Kensington and Chelsea, I visited the joint most deprived ward in London and spoke to councillor Emma Dent Code about how the rise in food poverty is reflected through her casework. Uh, certainly my experience um, in the past nine years now on the council, um, it was very rare that we saw somebody who was struggling with their food bills. Now we see it all the time. Um, we have people visibly shrinking physically, <laughs> parents shrinking to, yeah. so they can feed their children um, and um, I think it's just you know the, the bills are going up and their wages are stagnant and the, certainly their rents are going up even council rents are going up a lot and service charges it's just the incremental eating away of that of their food budget because they have to pay everything else or they get evicted or the electricity gets cut off but food they can squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. I heard about a young man who was trying to start a career he had done everything possible to get on. He'd gone to college to learn a trade, but the only job he could get at the end of it was on a zero hours contract. Some weeks this meant he got a full week's pay, others just a day or so's work, or occasionally none at all, meaning he faces a regular choice between a payday lender or visiting a food bank. This woman was a walking skeleton and I was embarrassed to see that. Um, another uh, parent who had been moved out of the borough for various reasons, not her fault at all. I had a full-time full job, uh, minimum wage, um, and suddenly her fares went up to £40 a week, um, and that came straight out of her food bill. So somebody else had lost a stone, and I'd never seen anybody so tiny, um, um, her clothes falling off her, and I, we should never, ever see that in a country like Britain. It is absolutely shameful. We see people at work at the end of the time they've, they've got their wages, they've paid out, they haven't got enough left to buy food. Food seems to be the disposable thing because you want the roof over your head, you want to keep warm, you want to have lights. So the only thing that seems to be disposable is food. So you do without it. A number of pair mothers say, I keep my house going because I have teas with lots of sugar. That can't be a lifestyle. Somewhere down the line, we're going to pay the price for it. Hunger affects people of all ages. Pressure on family budgets particularly affects children. No child should go hungry, and hunger impacts on a child's development and ability to learn. You also hear anecdotally uh, teachers talking about children coming into school who are hungry, who 
gone to school after having had a packet of crisps or a Coke or, or actually, in fact, nothing. And children and teachers having to bring food into school. A number of councils in London have introduced free school meals for all children in primary schools as a way to tackle child hunger. Well, Islington's a borough of extremes. We've got a, a lot of affluence in Islington, but we've also got an awful lot of poverty as well. We've got, this, you know, we've got the second highest level of child poverty in the whole country. And um, we were acutely aware in 2010 that there were lots of people in our borough who were really struggling to find the money to f eat properly or to feed their kids properly. The main reason why children come to school too hungry to learn in London is because their families have not got enough money to buy food. They're running out of, running out of money. So many of our parents are trying to keep hold of two or three zero hour contract jobs, which mean that they're working very long hours often, uh, not there for the children, not there to cook for the children. And, and still not having enough money to be able to put food on the table. There's one in one school, uh, Randall Kramer over in Hackney, it's a brilliant school, we had a, a journalist that came in to talk to the kids and was just saying, well surely this lack of breakfast is just about bad parenting. And we sat down and there, and there was a little girl who, uh, I said, just go and talk to the kids, ask them. And the wee girl just said, look, my mum gets up early um, and goes out to work. I get my brother up and it's after my mum's gone. If there's cereal, we have some cereal, but if there's nothing, then I go up to the road to the calf and I ask them for a sandwich. And, you know, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And if they don't, then we have to wait till lunchtime. But my brother's crying in the morning. And I could see this journalist kind of go from being, it's all about bad parenting, to, you know, and I was saying, you can, you can support parents to feed their kids at home, but if they've got no money, and these kids are going home to empty cupboards, and that's the thing, it's like, it is, when you've sat down with a child who is telling you that they've got a stomach ache, that they are feeling faint, and children are fainting with malnutrition in our classrooms in London. We do have enough food to feed everyone, however, despite this, people are going hungry, while at the same time, there is still substantial amounts of food going to waste. Food Cycle is a UK charity that collects surplus food from the back of supermarkets, markets and green grocers. We take that food and we convert it into a three course meal for people at risk of food poverty and social isolation. Um, we also work with elderly people and the, the reason people often come to Food Cycle is there is no stigma attached. We do not ask for people to be referred. If you turn up at a Food Cycle you're in need of Food Cycle's care and attention. Um, and we know this is particularly important for the elderly who often feel a huge stigma attached and not being able to afford food or make ends meet. But the fact that they've, if they've come to a food cycle, they've been made to feel welcome, they haven't had to prove that they're in food poverty, they sit down, they make friends, and then they can come back week after week in a social setting um, it, without having any stigma attached we know that we can actually access some of those much harder to reach groups. We've also been working to pioneer the social supermarkets, which are a kind of newish concept. What we do is we buy food that's been manufactured, but for some reason can't be sent to a, a normal retail environment. Might be because there's an issue with the packaging, it might be that um, a cancelled order or the food's in the wrong place at the wrong time. But for whatever reason, the retailers can't sell that food anymore. We buy that from the manufacturer, we bring it here to our social supermarket and we sell it at about a 70% discount to people who really need that food the most. And whilst there is three and a half million tonnes of surplus food produced every year, in the grander scheme of our food supply chain, that's the tiniest drop in the ocean of food. So for lots of the big manufacturers, they see that almost as just a rounding error. Those numbers are so small to them, they're almost insignificant. All of our members get offered a, a very wide ranging package of professional support services that allows them to address the causes and the consequences of their food poverty. It's about working out what actually brought somebody here to a social supermarket. That's very rarely simply that they can't feed the family. It's often a very complicated mix of things like payday lending, of unemployment or underemployment, mental health problems and domestic violence. And it's all of those issues that our community hub allows people to unpick and start to address whilst they've got access to deeply discounted food. 
of one lady that I met in our Clacton upon Sea hub, uh, Linda. Effectively, she's a lady who um, is unable to work because she has to care for her husband full time. He is disabled. She also has three children who unfortunately have special needs. For Linda, we know that coming to Food Cycle is the only opportunity she has in a week to sit down and try and forget about her problems and sit with some friends and be looked after, shown care, shown attention. People shouldn't have to get in that position. People, you don't, you shouldn't have. This is a first world country for Christ's sake. You shouldn't have to feel that way or to go down to food bank and because things like that. Systems should be in place to help people who are in need um, to get out of where they, 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 where they find themselves. I think one of the problems with charitable food aid uh, is that it works very well, at, can work very well at a local level, but it doesn't really do the heavy lifting, as we've said, for, for a problem that, it, that, that is chronic. One of the problems with, that charities have, often food banks are kind of teetering on the edge in that, have they got enough food for this week? Your dependence on the kindness of strangers, really. People giving you food that they've, a bit of extra, few cans that they bought from the supermarket that week to donate to you. So it's a very fragile ecosystem. It's vital that we move beyond this fragile patchwork of support and think about how we can end food poverty and achieve zero hunger. I do think it's possible to eliminate hunger in, in Britain, but there's no one magic button to push. Clearly the government's got a role with how the benefit system runs, both with this casual way benefits are paid um, and with not adequate warnings about sanctions that are going to fall on your head. But there's again the uh, making sure the poor's income goes further with uh, getting wages up to a living wage level, the rip off merchants in gas and electricity, not penalising because you're poor. At Food Cycle, we support the living wage. All of our staff are paid the London living wage. Um, and we think that that is very important for employers to actually demonstrate and show that they care for their employees by supporting the, the living wage campaign. It's definitely possible to end food poverty. Let me take my little micro bit of it. Ending child hunger as a barrier to learning, ending child hunger as a barrier to enjoying your life. We know it's, it is not expensive to sort this out. Magic Breakfast provides a healthy meal for 22p, that's the orange juice, bagel, uh, cereal and porridge. And, you know, when you think about what we want to invest in as a society, do we want to invest 22p in every child getting the four hours of most important lessons and then going on to do well at school and hopefully do well in their lives? Or do we want to ignore that? So free school meals for all is an absolutely crucial part of our work to address food poverty and to help parents in really tough times. Uh, introducing free school meals for all has had a number of really positive effects. The first one is we've taken the stigma away from claiming school meals. So it's just a form that everyone fills in as part of their, the endless forms that you fill in when you start primary school. Yes, absolutely. And I think what we can do is look to particularly human rights based approaches as a way of doing that. You know, these are really progressive frameworks for achieving the right to food for everybody in, uh, in your country. Um, and I think they provide us really progressive frameworks where everybody, not just the state, but also NGOs and, co and community initiatives and, and crucially people um, can come together and really pursue this agenda. It will take some quite bold decisions and thinking quite differently about what we're prepared to intervene in, particularly in terms of labour and food markets, which we have a traditionally, particularly the food market, we don't traditionally mess around with that too much in this country. So it will involve some quite radical thinking probably, but really when faced with with this it's a hugely growing, rapidly rising need for emergency food provision. I think now's the time we need to do it more than ever. The other thing to say is uh, the evidence from North America, where food banks have been established for, for, for three decades now, is that for all that food banks have expanded and uh, they've developed infrastructure and logistics systems and so on, food poverty hasn't declined. That more people than ever are using food banks in Canada, for example even though the charitable contribution has, has, uh, has increased over the years. 
This video has highlighted the fact that the causes of hunger and of food poverty are complex. From rising food prices to rising costs generally, people are struggling to make ends meet and sometimes this can cause a crisis. At the other end of the spectrum, there's the grinding hunger of people who, who cut back on food on a, on a long-term basis, from mums who prioritise their children eating to older people facing a choice between heating and eating and children who skip breakfast and only eat one meal in the day at school. It's really important that we focus on making sure that we get the systemic issues in welfare addressed. The picture might seem bleak, but there is hope and it is possible with political will and with concerted effort from everybody from voluntary organisations through to politicians to make a difference and to eliminate hunger. We can achieve zero hunger. We can make sure that people aren't forced to rely on the kindness and strangers, but it will take a huge effort by government and by the next mayor to make this happen and to achieve the goal, the only goal that is appropriate of zero hunger.